Welcome to Ancient Wisdom. That's a very generic title, but it's actually a very narrow topic that we want to look at. We want to spend 10 weeks looking for early Christian creeds that even predate the writing of the New Testament and early Christian hymns that the New Testament authors uh, appealed to to make a point. Uh, you know, the New Testament was written within uh, 30 to 60 years after Jesus' death. Uh, it already contains both creeds and hymns. And from time to time, the biblical authors will appeal to those creeds and hymns. Now, this isn't really surprising. Judaism had creeds and hymns. On a daily basis, they would... Uh, stand, face the east, and uh, recite the Shema. Uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. They had other prayers that they memorized, other main passages of scriptures that they learned. And they had an entire book of hymns, the Psalms that they would sing. So in the new church, it's not surprising that they uh, focused on learning uh, new theology, a new understanding of how God was saving them by repeating creeds and hymns. Now, I was first uh, alerted to this reality in this little book called The Unity of the New Testament by A. M. Hunter, and as I dove deeper, I found this uh, book, a classic by J. N. D. Kelly, Early Christian Doctrines. Both of them refer to creeds and hymns that were found in the New Testament. Today, we just want to talk about how to identify creeds and hymns that we might find in the New Testament. Let's start with the creeds. First of all, creeds themselves are meant to be memorable. They focus on the essence of theology, the core that the biblical authors wanted to communicate. Creeds are poetic in structure, especially with parallelism, and they tend to be short, sometimes even omitting major uh, elements of syntax in their expression. For example, 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Beyond question, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Now we catch the parallelism in the English translation. In Greek, out of six lines, five of them have a passive verb, the preposition n, and then a noun. Uh, revealed in flesh, vindicated in spirit. The only line that doesn't have in, he was seen by angels, proclaimed in nations, believed in the world, taken up in glory. We'll come back later and talk about the significance of that creed. For now, we're just noticing the form. You can see the way the parallelism is structured there. Creeds are introduced in many different ways. Sometimes they're not introduced at all. But three of the ways when there are introductions kind of stand out. First of all, word of faith. Literally, uh, faith is the word, or faithful is the word. This phrase occurs five times, all in the pastorals. 
the translations will say this statement is true or this saying is faithful, this saying is trustworthy. I think it's interesting that what it literally says is the word faith. Today we even talk about our statement of faith. It's the core theology that we believe. I think that's what uh, Paul is communicating in this case. This is the core of our theology. One example of this is in 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. This statement is trustworthy. I'm reading from the New American Standard. That is how uh, New American Standard expresses the word faithful. This statement is trustworthy. For if we died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he can't deny himself. Do you see the structure of the creed there? It's beautiful, isn't it? A second way that uh, creeds are sometimes introduced is by the word, what I have received, using the Greek word paralambano, and that means I have received it entirely. And what I have passed on, in Greek, para didomi, and that means I have given totally. <laughs> so what I totally received, I totally gave to you. These two words are used to refer to creeds a total of 10 times in the New Testament. Sometimes it's just what I've received. Sometimes it's just what I've passed on. But twice these two phrases, these two words occur together. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 5. For I handed down to you, I paradidomi, I passed on to you as of first importance what I also received, paralambano, what I totally took in. And here it is, here's the creed. Christ died for our sins. Now I think Paul inserts the next phrase, according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. And again, Paul inserts the phrase, according to the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Now if you'll notice here, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, the chapter in which Paul talks about the resurrection, he lays down, uh, he, he, he supports his argument by appealing to this ancient creed. Christ died for our sin, he was buried, he was raised, and he appeared. And then he goes on to talk about the reality of resurrection. We find the same phrase, what I received and what I gave to you, in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, that we frequently read just before the Lord's Supper. What I received, I also passed on to you, that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and then we read the rest of that. We'll come back and talk about the meaning and the importance of the content of these creeds later. A third way that uh, biblical authors refer to these early creeds is with the word tradition. Tradition in Greek is the noun form of the verb for passing down simply. It only occurs three times, 1 Corinthians 11, 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. In each case, it actually does not refer to a specific creed, but instead to the totality 
of what Paul had passed down to his followers. So that's a little of how to identify creeds. Let's move on to hymns. Hymns are primarily uh, not introduced. The authors don't say, do you remember this hymn? They just quote the hymn, but they stand out by their parallelism and their poetic form. And sometimes they have meter in Greek. <clears throat> now, I believe that some of the hymns were composed in Aramaic and being translated into Greek. They lose the meter. But apparently some were written in Greek and you can catch the flow of the hymn as well in Greek. Frequently in modern versions of the Bible, they are printed with indented margins. Uh, they're printed actually in verses, strophe, and there are others markers that uh, new translations of the Bible will uh, put them in so that we see that there is a poem or a hymn being quoted here. Look, for example, at Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. We have five verses of a hymn that apparently consisted of three lines per verse. And it talks about Christ as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Second verse. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of men. Third verse. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Paul inserts the phrase, and that, death on a cross. Fourth verse, for this reason God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name. And the last verse, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. And I believe here Paul inserts the knees of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And the last line of that verse, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe again, Paul ends that hymn by saying, glory be to God the Father. <laughs> we see similar hymns in Colossians 1, 15 to 20, in Romans 8, 31 to 34. In uh, upcoming weeks, we're going to take a particular topic and try to look at all of the creeds and hymns that treat that topic. What we'll find is that everything comes back to Jesus. I look forward to seeing you in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm.